Farbrook. This is Tasha Bernice in Farbrook's Community Development Center area of our church, which is also my favorite area of the church. My relationship with Farbrook started with the CDC 15 years ago when my daughter was part of their childcare program. Farbrook CDC has been a part of my daughter's life since she was four years old, and now she's in her second year engineering student at North Carolina a and Before working at Spring ISD as the CT Academy Specialist, I was part of the CDC staff that helped it become the largest CDC in our area that served thousands of students and parents through educational services, before and after school programs, summer camps, jobs, benevolence, counseling, and so much more. Farbrook has been bridging gaps in our community for nearly two decades by creating a positive atmosphere where students and parents can thrive. Pastor Mike's message on economic reconstruction reflects what Farbrook CDC has been doing in this community for many years. Last week's message talked about Nehemiah's accountability, and I can still hear Pastor Mike reminding the staff daily that every kid that comes through the doors is my kids, and he held us accountable to treat them like they were his. This Sunday, Pastor Mike will bring the book of God's Word in Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 16, when Nehemiah's personal commitment to the community reveals his willingness to be an example and not ask others to do what he wasn't willing to do himself. You don't want to miss this message either live or online. See you Sunday for another epic time in the Lord. Amen. Let's show the Lord some love. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Truly, there is none, no one, nothing that is quite like you. Nothing compares. We come today and we want to give you our unwavering uncompromised, fully committed devotion and worship to you. We ask now that you might bless these moments that we spend in your word. Do something that would be remarkable in all of our lives. Bless these moments we spend in the word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's show the Lord some more love. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Before I was coming down, I was in level seven Holy Ghost preparation mode. And outside my door, it was three deacons. No, two deacons and one elder. And uh, they was talking about how the Yankees got bounced. And I think they were talking loud enough so I could hear them. And I, and I just, you know, want them to know how ungodly that was. You know, I'm in Holy Ghost preparation mode, and they're going to bring something like that up. Even while I was out, you know, yesterday we were serving, you know, bringing, um, um, uh, putting food in people's uh, cars yesterday. And I got approached by this coach, and he, he kind of alluded to it, Deacon West, and and I was surprised that Deacon Hutchison, normally me and him are always on the same page, he brought it up. I, so I'm just going to let you all know, I've been under attack for the last few days. I've been under heavy attack. So y'all pray for me that I'll be able to get through this message. Amen. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Anyway, let's uh, jump into this message as we continue on economic reconstruction. And uh, we've been connecting the dots on economic reconstruction that it requires some things in order to get it done. It requires vision. We looked at that. It requires cooperation. We certainly went over that, and we looked at it. It requires inspiration, and we certainly put forth that Economic reconstruction requires an amount of courage. And also we looked at it requires prayer. And then for the past several weeks, we've been looking at how it requires introspection. So turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 5, and we'll read verse 14 through 19. May we stand as we read God's Word on today. Nehemiah 5, beginning with verse 14. 
Moreover, from the day that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah from the 20th year to the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, for 12 years, neither I nor my kinsmen have eaten the governor's food allowance. But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants domineered uh, the people. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also applied myself to the work on this wall. We did not buy any land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 Jews and officials besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now, that which was prepared for each day was one ox. We talked about last week, those them ox tails and six choice sheep, and them lamb chops, and also birds that were prepared for me. We know what that gospel bird is. If you don't know, in the church, we got a gospel bird. And, and once in 10 days, all sorts of wine were finished in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the governor's food allowance because the servitude was heavy on this people. Remember me, O oh my God, for good according to all that I have done for this people. You may be seated. So, economic reconstruction requires introspection, this internal look. When facing internal opposition, we learn that Nehemiah helped his people to understand the community challenges, but not only that, he helped his people to come up with community solutions. He also helped his people by being personally, personally, personally committed to economic reconstruction. So, so we see that Nehemiah was certainly on a personal level committed to seeing his community get better. And so we're going to continue looking at this internal personal commitment as we look into Nehemiah's personal commitment as we now move to verse 16 that provides, that is, Nehemiah provided solutions to community challenges. It's one thing, again, to talk about what needs to be done. It's another thing to have solutions. Nehemiah was a man of solutions and not just talking about the challenges in the community. And so I want to begin by sharing that last week we looked at Nehemiah's promotion as governor. Today we'll look at Nehemiah's example. And let me say that Nehemiah understood something. He understood that example is leadership. Let me say that again. Example is a leadership. So leadership is not what you say but leadership is what you do. And so if you want to download something into your children from when they were small, let them know that example is leadership and not so much what they say. So whether they're in school or anywhere else, example is uh, leadership. And so Nehemiah understood example is leadership and his example as governor was on the heels of a legacy of corruption in the previous administrations. And so Nehemiah's example, what made his example just such an illustrious example was that it was on the heels of such high level of corruption. So Nehemiah came after a legacy of corruption, 
but yet he was able to rise above all of the corruption that existed because he gave an example that was following what God would desire in his life. And so he, this is what made his example so illustrious, is that it was on the heels of a legacy of corruption in all of these previous administrations. And so when a legacy or an example of corruption exists with government officials, it is common for incoming officials to continue the previous administration's legacy of corruption. And this happens over and over and over again. You'll have a legacy of corruption in government or other organizations, and those that are new coming in, they just simply fall in line and follow the corruption of the previous administration. And that's the reason why you can see in governments when you study history that sometimes just generations after generations in government, you see corruption over and over and over again because those that are new coming in, they just fall in line and continue the corruption. And so when we, when we look at these legacies or examples of, of corruption, we often see that it is common for incoming officials to, con to continue this legacy of corruption. And so Nehemiah, though, his illustrious example is remarkable because it serves as a model on breaking legacies of, of corruption. Do you know that even in families, God desires for legacies of corruption to be broken, that God does not desire for generation after generation of corruption to exist. It may be a son, and he may have seen a legacy of corruption from his father, and God wants you to break that legacy of corruption and be the man that God has called for you to be. It may be a young lady, you may have seen a legacy of corruption in your mother, and God is calling you, yes, love your mother, but he's calling you to break that legacy of corruption. Why? Because God can break the chains of corruption in all of our lives. You don't have to be like the previous administration. And oftentimes people say, well, I'm just falling in line. Everybody before me did it. Everybody before me was getting paid. Everybody before me, they got big houses and cars and money and all this other kind of stuff and built up fat retirements and, and had all these deals on the side. Everybody else. So, Pastor, you asking me not to fall in line. I'm not asking you to do, to do nothing, but God is. I'm not asking, I'm asking you to be like Nehemiah and be an example to others. Wow. Wow. So let's look at this following after a legacy of corruption. Because the reality is, is that all of us may face a season in our life to where you may be faced with following a legacy of corruption. You might see some situations where corruption existed before you got there, and now you got to make a decision whether or not you're just going to fall in line or whether or not you're going to be God's man or God's woman for this situation. And so last time, verse 15 shed light on the previous governors and their staff and their exploitation. It showed us their example of exploiting the community for financial gains. Verse 15 reveals that. And they did it despite all the economic challenges in the community. And that was absolutely ridiculous. And so what made the corruption and exploitation of the previous governors so egregious, what made it so egregious was their exploitation of people from the community that they served. I don't think it's no worse exploitation than to exploit the very people that you say that you love to exploit the very people, the very community that you say that you love, to exploit the very community from which you came from. Wow, this is where they were, and this is what made what they were doing was so egregious because the community that they were supposed to be serving, this was the very community that they were exploiting. As bad as it is for those outside the community, to come in the community and exploit people. But I think that it is even more egregious when you have insiders that are exploiting the very people that they say, I have come to serve. That is absolutely egregious. 
And so following after this legacy of corruption, that's where Nehemiah was. And one thing I notice about this legacy of corruption in verse 15 as well is that it was an infectious path of corruption. This local government was on an infectious path of corruption, and it was so, so contagious that it made corruption a community norm. It became a normative in the community. It was a common example with limited pushback from the community. Do you know that corruption can exist in a community? Corruption can exist in a family? Corruption can exist in, in, inside of an organization to where it becomes the norm? That it is normal to engage in corruption? Do you know that every time that happens, that that is an indictment against God and we ought to break the chain of corruption wherever it is? And do you know corruption was so infectious that corruption and local government became normal? It became easy to do and it was justified during this time. And so, and so here's the deal. You let corruption exist in your home and it will become normal. It will become easy to do and it will, over time, it will be justified. There are people that they will justify why they are corrupt. They'll say, well, pastor, you don't realize, you know, when I, when I took this job, you don't know how hard I work and they ain't paying me enough money. You know what I got to tell them folk who say that? Then you should not have taken the job for that, for that amount of money. You should have did something else. But if you agree to a government job, if you agree to a job somewhere and you agree that they pay you X amount of dollars, that is all you are supposed to get and all that other stuff is illegal and you need to find another job if you want to get some more money. God has not called us to accept the job and then justify why we got all these little side deals going on and exploiting the people. Why? Because the bottom line is that Corruption can be infectious. It can, it, can, it can be contagious. And we've got to guard against the corruption infectiousness like we do the infectiousness of COVID-19. I'm going to tell you right now, it, it, ain't, it ain't very many folk I know that they're not guarding against COVID-19 and, 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 and they mask up and all that kind of stuff. I don't go nowhere without wearing no mask. I'm not playing with COVID-19. Let me tell you something, I'm not playing with it. It is not a toy to be played with at all. Wear your mask and, and wear it well. Matter of fact, if you don't like wearing it, get you one. They got all different kind of ones. They got ones with different colors. They got ones with the whole, almost the whole face, a little bit of your face. They got some with the cotton, one with this, some with that. Find the one that you like and wear your mask. Why? Because we've got to guard against COVID. 19. Now, we also got to guard against corruption as well. We must guard against infectious legacies of corruption in our families. You've got to guard against it in your families and corporation and government and other organizations. You know, I, I shared at 8 o'clock about my youngest son, Colin, and, uh, you know, and y'all know how much I love, you know, all the deacons. I, I, I trust these dudes. They can come live with me. Every single one of them could come live with me. That's how much I trust them. We are on good terms. However, one deacon took my son when he was a little thing, and the deacon didn't do nothing wrong. He, you know, he was just taking him. He was watching him for me, and he took him to um, um, one of those, um, like, flea market type, type places, and Colin was, was young. And so he took him in, and he was letting Colin pick up some stuff. And, and so, he, so there was some stuff over there. He said, Colin, you know, grab some of those things as well. And so Colin said, well, no, I can't. I can't. I can't get one of those. So he said, why can't you get one of those? He said, my daddy won't let me bring bootleg CDs in the house. <laughs> Little corruption leads to big corruption. You, do, do, you, do, you, do, do you feel me? Get them bootleg CDs out your house. <laughs> yeah, hey, 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 Little corruption leads to big corruption. You know, that, that same son, when he was young, I don't know how old he was, he ran into, um, 
you know, a girl they knew, not that it was dating, you know, they, they were just friends. And, and, and so he, he went into a, 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 a food type establishment and uh, he was getting, um, buying some food. And so they knew each other, they talked out of that. And so she said, um, uh, don't worry about it, just, just, just go on. And so he took it and he all excited, Daddy, Daddy, I, I ain't have to pay for this. I said, I said, I said, I said, I said what happened? And when he told me the story, you know, I told him, I said, Colin, you and her could have got arrested. He said, why, Dad? I said, because she don't own nothing in that store. She can't give you nothing for free. She can't give you something that somebody else owned for free. Now, if she would have went in her pocket and took her money out and paid for it, that's different. But she can't give you nothing for free. And here's the deal. If we don't teach our children small things about corruption like that, Small corruption leads to big corruption. We've got to realize we've got to guard against the infectious legacies of corruption in every area of our lives. So that's the infectious path of corruption. But I like this about Nehemiah. He had a generous path of benevolence. Man. When it came to Nehemiah's time, when it came to Nehemiah's money, he lived life on a generous path of benevolence. This is what Nehemiah believed. He believed sweat equity and generous giving was necessary to help his community. Now, let me say this. If you hear people talk about helping any community, you ask them a couple of questions. Are you willing to put sweat equity and generous giving to help this community? If they not willing to give those, they not ready to help the community. All they doing is talking. You might want to get off of that call because they just yapping. Do you know our communities need people to give sweat equity? and generous giving in order for us to help our communities to be what God has designed for them to be. And that is the exact example that Nehemiah gave for his community. Sweat equity and generous giving. In verse 10, he used his money for no interest loans for the poor. Remember, we talked about that. He said the poor need some money, and, and, and instead of sending them to the payday loan places and all that kind of stuff, Nehemiah said, listen, I'm going to give you out of my own money. Not somebody else, out of my own money. I'm going to give you all loans with no interest. Out of his own money. He did that in verse 10. Then in verse 16, he used sweat equity and his own money to build on the wall. He had a section of the wall that he was responsible for. He, him, and he made those who work for him work as well. They worked on his section on the wall. He provided the sweat equity himself and his employees, and he used his own money. You see, this is a dude that's committed to helping his community, and he wasn't looking for ways to find money for somebody else to do it, and this is a quick thing that people will often do. We'll see that people or community need something, and we'll say, let me see if I can find you some money. What's wrong with your money? You know what I'm saying? I, I mean, what's wrong with your money? There's nothing wrong with you, some of your money. Nehemiah used his own sweat equity and his own money to help build on this wall. In verse 17 and 18, he used his own money again to feed and entertain hundreds that came to his house. Yeah, again, this dude is using his own money. You know, we got folk that they won't even help their own family members with their own money. You know that God has given us resources in part for us to be benevolent towards other people. You think the only reason why you got that money is for you and those that reside in your house? You think that's the only place you're supposed to spend your money? And we talk about everybody else helping our community, but are we going to pull our own resources together and bless our community as well? This dude was amazing. This dude was all in financially. 
He was all in intellectually. He was all in physically for his community. He was all in. Are we all in? That's the question we've got to ask ourselves from an introspective way. We got to say, are we all in financially, intellectually, and physically for our community? And watch this. And I don't say this because I'm the pastor at Farbrook. I say this because this is a matter of fact that the data will lead this way. Without using government money. Say that again. Without using government money, nobody does more financially, intellectually, or physically for this community than the amazing members and friends of Fallbrook Church. Nobody. Over the years, we have given back millions of dollars in this community to make sure people are blessed. And it doesn't even matter the color. They come, they're black, white, Asian, Hispanic. They come and we've invested millions into this community. Why? Why? Why would Fallbrook do that? Because we got to put skin in the game. We don't wait on government grants around here because they, they, they haven't been coming. They haven't came. They haven't materialized. We don't wait on government grants around here because at the end of the day, if God wanted us to have a government grant, he, 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 he would bring one. Apparently, he didn't want us to have none, and we've still got more done than anybody else. Wow. Wow. Some people say, well, you know, I'm a supporter of the YMCA because they're YMCA. We do more than the YMCA in this, commu in, in this community. Don't come tell me about the YMCA. Don't come tell me about all these other places. Don't come tell me about that. At the end of the day, most of those places are getting money from every which way, but our money comes from tithes and offering of the members of this church. There is an amazing amount of members and friends of Fallbrook that do tons for this community. That's how you validate. That's how you validate a generous path of benevolence. You put your sweat equity and your money where your mouth is. You want to call with a bunch of people? I just love my community. I just love my community. I just love my community. You post on that little thing? Raise your hand if you put any sweat equity or any resources into this community. If nobody can raise their hand, you get off the call. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your time with a bunch of folk that want to talk, and they want to talk, well, we're going to get some grants, we're going to work on some grants. What grants? Where they at? Where are the grants? Where are they to bless this community? If somebody knows, let us know. We don't know where they at. Where they at, though? Like y'all people say, where they at, though? Where they at, though? Where they at, though? Where they at? And some people say they out there. Well, they shouldn't be that hard to get then. They should not be that hard to get if they're out there. Wow. Now watch this. Not a glorious path of benevolence, but a glorious path of restraint. Restraint and self-denial is difficult when we have many privileges. The more privileges you have, the more difficult it is to practice restraint on not using them. You say, I don't know, I explain, Pastor. Because you got so many things you can utilize. You, 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 you have less restraint because you have all these opportunities to do this and do this and do that. And so it's more difficult to have restraint and self-denial uh, when you have a lot of privileges. It's easy for somebody who don't have nothing to don't do nothing, right? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like years ago. Remember years ago? The love bow, soon you'll be making your... Uh, da, da, the love bow, da, 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 da. I used to watch it saying to myself, that love bow wasn't for me. We wasn't going on the love bow. Back then, it was only the, the wealthy pretty much went on the cruise. You just watch it just to watch it. But now, more people are able to go. There's more privileges. And so the more privileges we have, the more difficult it is to practice restraint and self-denial. And Nehemiah's restraint and self-denial, when he had an abundance of privileges, 
was nothing short of extraordinary. To be able to do whatever you want and then practice restraint is remarkable. Those are special people. To where they can practice restraint even though they can do whatever they want to do. Nehemiah put on a restraint clinic. He put a clinic on dealing with restraint, and it was absolutely amazing. When he refused his privileges, what privileges did he refuse, Pastor? To charge interest on loans. He had every right to charge interest on loans. He denied himself those privileges. You say, well, what else? He, he refused and denied allowances, the governors, the government food allowance. He denied that, the Bible says. It was his right, but he didn't take it. Why he didn't take it? The Bible said because the people were being heavily taxed and he didn't want to put more pressure on the people for them to be giving him their money. So he said, listen, y'all are too overtaxed. I'm going to take care of it myself. I'm good. Not only that, you say, well, 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 what else? You know, he, he also the, uh, refused to take 40 shekels of silver. This was his daily paycheck. He got a daily paycheck of 40 shekels, and this is a lot of money. He said, listen, y'all can't afford to pay me this kind of money. He said, nah, I'm, he said, we're not going that route. And so what we have here is the daily tax to support his personal and government expenses. He took over those as well. And then also, what about buying repossessed land? He said, listen, I'm not going to buy the land of people who lost their property because they couldn't afford to pay. He said, listen, I don't, I don't want that land. I'm not going to go in there and because the land is cheap and these folk are losing their, their, um, their, their, their land because of the drought and they can't afford to pay, I'm not going to come into that community and buy up all the land. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let them still maintain their land. Wow. And we say this about gentrification. Like gentrification today, during Nehemiah's time, influential people were scooping up property from struggling, less affluent people who could not make ends meet. They was doing it in Nehemiah's time. When Nehemiah was governor and offered no interest loans to the poor, it was his implemented policy to reject this type of gentrification. And do you know gentrification in America is just another name for exploitation in almost every case in cities around America, Chicago, Los Angeles, Houston, New York, St. Louis, all over the place. It is another name for exploitation. There must be Nehemiah-like Nehemiah -like policies today. Nehemiah-like legislation that protects less affluent communities from, pre from predators claiming economic development. They'll come in and say, we're doing economic development. Yeah, right. It's ironic that many tout gentrification as being positive when there's overwhelming historical evidence that gentrification is detrimental to less affluent people in cities across our country. Watch this. The billions spent on infrastructure, the billions spent on housing, the billions spent on consumption businesses, the, the, the billions spent on entertainment to rebuild these communities. What are they for? Where was the money at? In Harlem, before it was taken over? Where was the money at in Fourth Ward before it's being taken over? Where was the money at in Third Ward before it was being taken over? Where was the money at? Why do they spend billions now on infrastructure, housing, consumption, and entertainment? Why? Because they want to, it's designed to attract more affluent residents and raise the cost to live there and force out the native residents that have been living there for generations. It is the policy of the United States of America for both black and whites to go in and gentrify and they will put out all of the native residents that have lived there for generations. They're gone. They're gone and don't benefit at all. Nehemiah was a man of principle. He rejected policies that united government, investors, and religious leaders to sell out their community so they could exponentially increase rent 
and property taxes. He rejected any collaboration by affluent people to engage in predatory coercion and buyouts in order to extricate native residents from their homes so more affluent people could move in. He rejected that. He said, I will not buy the land of those who are losing their land because of exploitation. I will not buy their land. We've got to realize that we need people like Nehemiah. Nehemiah example shows all privileges are not to be enjoyed. And this is a sign of a mature Christian when you realize that all of your privileges are not to be enjoyed. When this church came to me back when we was in the school, and they said, Pastor, we want to make you full time. I told the church back then, the church is not ready to make me full time. I said, I got a job at FedEx. I'm making enough money. I got medical benefits and all of that my family's taken care of. I do not need to be a strain and a burden on this church so that one day we can make moves for God and all of the money not sitting up in my account. Why? Did I, did I have a privilege? To do that, yes. Was it the right thing to do? No. And that's why it was rejected. Farbrook, here's the deal. Watch me, watch me. When you are a mature believer, you know that there are some privileges you got to practice restraint on. Sometimes you got to take less and give more. Sometimes you got to take less and give more. Sometimes you got to take less and give more. 1 Corinthians 9, Paul used layers of illustrations about the glorious path of restraint that brings glory to God and advance the gospel. He says, for it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written because the plowman ought to plow in hope and the thresher to, to thresh in hope of sharing in the crops. And he goes on with some more illustrations. What is he saying? He's saying the bottom line is that I'm in Corinth. And yes, do I deserve to make a living from you guys because I'm coming here and spending this time doing ministry? He said, he said, yes, absolutely. The Bible says it's okay. But the Lord leaded him to say, listen, at Corinth, there was something going on from a financial nature. And he said, listen, I don't want to get a penny from y'all. God's going to take care of me another way. And, and he had every right to take that privilege, but he did not. There will be times in life where God says, take less, give more. Take less, give more. Take less, give more. And mature Christians understand that. You show me anybody in leadership that is willing to ruin an organization so they can have all these financial exploits, I'll show you somebody who don't care about them at all at all. Here's the deal. Sometimes we got to practice restraint. Can you, can, you, can you do it? Yes. Should you do it is the other question. There are times when we got to take less and give more, but we're out of time, so let's pray. Father, we bless your name. We love you, Lord, because Nehemiah was a benevolent dude. He was a giving kind of God. Sweat equity, he did. Financially committed, he did. Practice restraint, he did. Take less, give more, he did. Was concerned about the people, he was. Made sure his community was taken care of, he did. Wow. This is the kind of example for us. For us. To teach us. To show us. To lead us. Father, I pray if there's someone in here that you've never called on the name of the Lord to be saved. Pray that you know God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He sent his son Jesus to die for your sins. He lived the perfect life, so he was able to be a sacrifice for us when he came to earth, and he lived here. And he died on the cross. He was crucified for our sins. All of the sins of the world were poured upon him. And he simply asked that we call upon his name, call upon him to save us. That's all we have to do. 
So if you understand that we're all sinners and we all are, I am, you are, my family, your family, we all are sinners, and you want to be forgiven of your sins, you can call on Jesus right now. When I pray this prayer out loud, you pray it in your heart and you mean it and you will be saved. Pray this prayer in your heart. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to earth to save me, to rescue me from my sins. Thank you for taking and paying the price for my sins. I ask that you forgive me of my sins. Forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me. Lord, I place you as the Lord of my life. I make you Lord, the boss of my life, Jesus. You're my boss. You're my new boss. You're in charge. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. If you prayed that prayer, you're a believer, you're saved, you've been rescued. Your sins have been forgiven. Your sins of, of your past, your current sins, and your sins to come, they've all been forgiven. That's what salvation does. Then others may want to come and recommit, rededicate their life to the Lord. You can do that. You can, you can repent right now. And what that means is just turn in the, the other direction. If you was going south, time to go north. If you was going west, it's time to go east. Go in the other direction. Follow the Lord, the Lord's direction. In, in every area of your life, do that right now. Do that right now, one by one, two by two, all over the place. Do that right now. Begin to confess, Lord, I'm going in a new, new direction. I'm going in a new direction. Do that right now. God hears you. God will bless you. Then others may want to unite with our church. If you want to do that, you call us. You get on the phone. You call us. You shoot us an email. You respond online. You can even come up here. We'll social distance and, and have our mask on, and we'll talk with you and, and all of that. We want to be a part of our church family or for any other reason. So, Father, we thank you. Bless those that have made decisions. Help them be all that you've called for them to be. And we offer this prayer up in the beautiful name of Jesus. May the church stay together. Amen. Let's show the Lord some love. Amen. 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 Those that have been watching, God bless you. Looking forward to seeing you. And um, be safe out there. You know, practice um, 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 good habits. Wear your mask and uh, mask up, and, and, uh, and uh, we'll push through this when, whenever the Lord says so. And whether it's uh, sooner rather than later, later rather than sooner, whenever the God says we'll be done, we will be done. But God bless you all. Go Astros. And the only reason I'm pulling for the Astros is because I'm pulling for Dusty Baker. So I should say go Dusty Baker. And so, um, again, go Strohs. And that's the last thing you'll hear from me. God bless you. See you soon. Bye-bye. Amen, amen. We're going to have...